All right. So first, first Kings chapter 19, a little bit of background. Elijah is running for his life. He has destroyed the prophets of Baal, whom Jezebel, the king's wife, worships, and is now on the run. And in chapter Chapter 19, verse 4, it says, Elijah went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. Now, don't ask me what a broom tree is. I I don't know. And he asked for himself to die and said, Enough! Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. And he lay down and fell asleep under a broom tree. I still don't know what a broom tree is. But... I dare say that we all have days like this, where we are defeated before we even begin, where the problems of the world seem so overwhelming that we just can't face them. In this case, Elijah runs to a cave, but what's important to note is that he is retreating into himself. He is not facing his problems. He is not doing the work of a prophet, which is going to people. He's disappearing into a cave. Continuing in verse 5, it says, Behold, there was an angel touching him, and he said to him, Arise, eat. And he looked, and behold, there was at his head a round loaf of bread baked on hot coals and a pitcher of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. But the angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Arise, eat, because the journey is too long for you. Now, Elijah has slipped into this deep depression. He can't face his problems. He can't get out of bed, even with someone taking care of him. He just can't face the world. And so I can't help but think when this angel says, because the journey is too long for you, he's not talking just about the future. It's already been too long a journey. And Elijah needs his strength if he's going to keep being the prophet of God. We're going to skip ahead to verse 11. God said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord was passing by. And a great and powerful wind was tearing out the mountains and breaking the rocks in pieces before the Lord. When I read this, I think, is this really the Lord doing this? Or is this happening, is this describing Elijah's anguish? Is this describing his internal state? Because the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of gentle blowing. When Elijah heard it, He wrapped his face and cloak. He wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. Now, why is he wrapping his face in his cloak? According to the Torah, no one can look at the face of the Lord and live. We see in 1 Kings as well that when the Ark of the Covenant is being sent, someone sees that it's that the path is rocky and goes to steady it, and that person dies immediately for the hubris of having to help God. Because no one can look on the Lord and live. No one can touch the Lord and live. And Elijah knows that he is about to see the face of God and so wraps his face in his cloak so as not to look on the face of the Lord. He recognizes this, that the Lord is not in his anguish, it's not in his rage, that the presence of the Lord 
is this peaceful, gentle stillness. And he has to leave the cave to find it. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went and stood in the entrance of the cave. And behold, a voice came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? And that's a darn good question. What are you doing? You're a prophet of God. Why are you here in a cave? Why aren't you out talking to people, telling them the good news of the Lord, going, performing miracles? He asked him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Then he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of armies. And you went to a cave to find armies? Armies aren't in the cave. Elijah is a prophet. The prophet before him was Samuel, and Samuel was an anointer of kings. He anointed David. He anointed Saul before him. Prophets in Elijah's day didn't just go out into the wilderness and speak into the wind. They stood before the masses. They stood in the courts of kings. And here he is. What are you doing here, Elijah? Looking for the Lord, the God of armies. For the sons of Israel have abandoned your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I alone am left, and they have sought to take my life. Now, it's not false what he's saying. Although I do find it a bit telling in the next chapter, he meets with some prophets. So he might be exaggerating just a little bit. I really fear for Elijah's mental state. But the Lord's response is very telling. The Lord said to him, go, return your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you have arrived, you shall anoint Hazael, king over Aram. You shall anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, king over Israel. And you shall anoint Elisha as prophet in your place. When Elijah was disturbed, when he was distraught, the Lord sent an angel to take care of him. And when Elijah still wouldn't get out of bed and take care of himself. The Lord sent the angel again. And when Elijah still could not do what the Lord wanted him and needed him to do as his prophet, he gave him work. He gave him his purpose again. And he said, you shall anoint Elisha. He's going to train the next person who will be the prophet in Elijah's place. Elijah seems to feel alone and beset. And God's response to him is to take care of him, to reassure him of his purpose and his place in the world, and to make sure that he knows that his work is not in vain. He is training the next prophet. There will be more prophets. This doesn't give us a single commandment, but it does give us an example to live by. That when we're distraught and we feel like turning inwards. We know that the same spirit is in each and every one of us. The spirit of God takes care of us. And we might not be visited by an angel, but we can still be angels to one another. I don't believe that there are miracles sent down from the heavens, but I do believe that they come and knock on your door. I do believe that they call you on the phone. 
and I believe that it's our job as Christians to take care of one another. And that is the example that we have here in 1 Kings. But not only that, but it shows that whatever your problems, whatever your struggles, if God has called you to your purpose, whatever your purpose is in this life, God will give you what you need to accomplish it. So you don't have to worry about whether or not you have what it takes to do what God is calling you to do, whatever that is. Because if God is calling you, God will see you through. And even so, you have a whole community of Christians here to support you and encourage you and bring you bread and water and tell you, it's time to get out of bed already. <laughs> because we're brothers and sisters and siblings in Christ. Peace be with you.